Well, good morning and welcome to the second Open Networking Summit, which the Open Networking Foundation is very proud and pleased to be uh, helping to produce in cooperation with Open Networking Summits Incorporated. Um, just to let you uh, know, the uh, Open Networking Foundation has uh, some folders over by the registration desk for anyone to pick up. We're just stuffing them now. They have a white paper that just came out yesterday, a two-pager about ONF came out yesterday, and a press release that just came out today. We're celebrating our one-year anniversary since our public launch. So we thought we would issue a press release. The focus is on commercialization, and we actually are able to cite the deployments uh, that Yano-san just described at Genesis Hosting and Nippon Express. So feel free to stop by, pick this up, get some information. If you have any questions, come and talk to me. I'll try to have a table at lunch. Anybody wants to talk about joining the Open Networking Foundation. So this morning we have a session on enterprise data centers and scaling out and how you approach them. We have uh, four speakers. They'll each come up and, and give their talks. We'll take a few questions at the end of each one. And you'll see some pretty different approaches to tackling these problems um, that, that really accrue when you try to build these and run them for public access or for private access in real time and in, in varying scales. Our first speaker in the session is Igor Gashinsky. He's principal architect at Yahoo. He runs this data center very similar to the one that Urs and his team run at Google. And he has been in the thick of this for a long time. Now, now Igor is a fearless individual. He has survived things that you and I could not even dream of, of facing, starting with Chernobyl, where he was very close in the day of. Um, and he glows in the dark. Um, <laughs> but he does that because of his brilliance. So please welcome Igor Gashinsky. Hi, thank you very much. Yes, I do glow in the dark, but let's not uh, discuss which parts of me glow in the dark. <laughs> uh, so uh, this talk is SDN and Warehouse Scale Data Centers version 2.0. It's version 2.0 because I gave version 1.0 of this six months ago. And uh, this talk is actually going to be uh, on uh, what has changed in the past six months. Uh, I guess we're having some technical issues. No, there's only one. There you go. Uh, so first thing is, what is SDN and what is OpenFlow? Because uh, everybody seems to be using them quite interchangeably, so just to level set some terminology. Uh, most networking today is actually an integrated stack of a forwarding plane, so the ASICs that are involved in actual forwarding, the hardware management plane, which is really the how on how to talk to the uh, forwarding plane, then you have the management plane, which is the CLI that you log into in order to manage the switches, and the control plane that runs routing protocol and whatnot. And if you compare that to the server, you have uh, you know, CPU, RAM, disk, all that you know, generic PC components. On top of that, you have the x86 instruction set, you know, some operating system, and then applications. Uh, SDN in networking, at least to us, is this entire stack. Uh, and the OpenFlow is essentially the x86 instruction set. So what stayed the same between uh, you know, our thinking and direction of uh, where we think SDN uh, and OpenFlow belongs in from before to now? Well, data center virtualization. Uh, this is, to us, the use case for SDN. Um, a lot of people ask why. Well, uh, in a uh, large-scale data center, um, the requirements are that you want to build clusters of about 20,000 servers to kind of act in unison. And those 20,000 servers, assuming uh, 20, to, uh, 20 VMs to one server, look like there are 400,000 VMs. Those VMs are dual stack, V4, V6. Uh, they usually involve any-to-any uh, -any communication uh, patterns. So if you look at something like uh, Apache Hadoop, uh, the name node communicates with every other uh, node in the system. Same thing for a job tracker. Uh, there's a lot of cross-communication. Um, for efficient utilization of this equipment, uh, you want to be able to place any VM anywhere, and you want to be able uh, to move it anywhere else uh, for scheduling reasons, for performance reasons, uh, for load distribution. Um, you also want uh, this VM migration to be more or less hitless, which means you want to do it in sub-second intervals. And you want to make sure that there is a guaranteed consistency model to your network. This is actually really critical. 
the absolute last thing you want to do is to deliver a packet that's destined for VM1 to VM2. Just imagine if you were doing uh, hosting and you delivered a packet that was destined to American Express to Visa. Uh, you may not be doing hosting for either of them for much longer. So how do you deal with this? Uh, the fundamental problem here is that you have 400,000 ent uh, entities and you need to distribute that database to 20,000 devices. Um, that's actually a really difficult computer science problem. And uh, it's a, uh, there's a couple of different proposed solutions to it. One of them, uh, well, first of all, you can try to do it in hardware. So uh, you know, typical how data centers are built today. Uh, it's pretty hard to find uh, like rack switches that have 2 million FIB entries these days, uh, especially ones that you can buy cheaply. Um, so that doesn't work so well. Uh, also, people say, all right, well, just use BGP to distribute this information, and you know, we don't need OpenFlow. Great. Where's the consistency model in BGP? Uh, and you know, people at IETF especially are you know, pushing BGP as you know, the answer. Maybe something BGP-like might be an answer, uh, but the lack of a consistency model is a really huge um, problem for using that. Also, some people just say, well, you know, VPLS works just fine. You know, we'll flood, we'll discover it works. Yeah, let's flood and spray. Uh, or flood and pray. At some point, you know, I send a packet, send it to 10,000 destinations. One of them's the right one, right? Yeah, that works so well in your data center, especially when you're flooding at 10 gig line rate. So since all those things doesn't work, uh, don't really solve the problem, uh, programming the vSwitch from a centralized and hopefully distributed database to handle the scale is actually the right solution. And that is the perfect use case for SDN. This is really what it was built for, and Martin can talk a lot more about that. So that was what stayed the same. Here's some things that we've seen evolve. Uh, so I had a slide uh, six months ago that basically said, you know, back then you had an integrated control plane, management plane, forwarding plane that you went out and got from a hardware vendor, uh, be it whatever big name switch vendor. And we thought that you know, ultimately the direction of SDN is that you're going to buy a forwarding plane and some sort of a lightweight management plane from one vendor, and then you buy a control plane from somebody else, and this actually is what creates SDN. Well, it hasn't quite happened this way. This is still an envision, but we just haven't seen the market develop that way. Instead, what we're actually seeing is that uh, the forwarding plane has become quite commoditized, and there's only a couple of major vendors off that forwarding plane, uh, the guys who make the ASICs. And everybody else just takes basically the same hardware, the same sheet metal, uh, and you know, puts on a different paint job, and puts on a different branding sticker, and that's their box. There is some differentiation between vendors. They use different management CPUs and different architectures of that. But ultimately, every high-end, you know, 48 port, 10 gig E plus 4 by uh, 40 gig switch is the same exact sheet metal made by just a couple of different companies. Uh, it doesn't really matter who you buy it from. Ultimately, it's made by the same people. Um, the real differentiator right now is the management plane and control plane. And what we're seeing is that uh, almost everybody runs some sort of a Unix flavor on a, under the hood, and then their management plane is really just a uh, application container that runs within that, and then it's got the control plane uh, as more process in that. What we have seen is, and what we have been pushing for really hard, is to get exposure to that Unix uh, that's under the hood. Uh, whether it's Linux or FreeBSD or whatever else you choose to call it, we want access to that underlying thing because we want to be able to run agents on the box. Because the second we can run agents in the box, we could actually pseudo emulate the whole SDN ecosystem. And the really cool thing is at least half of the vendors that we're talking to, and I do mean at least half of the vendors that we're talking to, actually have this. Six months ago, there was one. Right now, a lot of really major people who you would never expect to have this actually have this. And that's a huge step forward. So you might ask, why is it important? Why is it a huge step forward? Well, so in terms of configuration and deployment automation, Erz talked about, you know, it, it's actually not an easy thing to do. Uh, so if you look at uh, a like kind of a logarithmic graph where all the way in the left is completely manual, you edit config files by hand, or you log into switches, you type commands, whatnot. And on the, all the way on the right is just magic. You think it, it happens, IP telepathy. 
Um, the servers right now are about halfway down that line. Um, between stuff like Chef and Puppet and other technique uh, management technologies like that, uh, you know, uh, it's all template-driven, roles-based, uh, recipe-based systems that actually program and deploy. You really just add another host to a role, and it gets these 20,000 software packages on it that are all configured properly you know, through recipes with translated. It's actually really, really automated. Mostly because most people have about 40 times the servers than they do networking. Because of that, networking uh, automation is all the way over there. Uh, you might have some automatic configuration uh, you know, generation. You might have separate push processes. But updating of that is actually really poor. Um, the ability to run, the ability to have Unix on the box that's native, that can execute native environment commands, allows you to just take those chef and puppet-like stuff that you have on your servers, install that same binary or you know, the same Perl script or whatnot on the switch, and you actually got 90% of the way there. You can use the same chef puppet-like recipes and templates in order to automate configuration generation, management, deployment, and updating of your network. That is actually huge. Uh, it takes us you know, from caveman era all the way pretty close to where we, uh, we are with the servers today. Well, is that really it? Well, yes. Uh, the next uh, thing that most people are looking for is that um, networks are kind of dumb. Uh, but we want them to be self-healing. Uh, we want them to kind of, when things go wrong, just magically work. And while we're at it, I want a pony. So this is a bit of a blast from the past. Uh, I actually recently found this. Uh, this is a slide from a presentation that Yahoo gave to the IEEE uh, high-speed study group in 2007. Um, this was, we be, uh, the, for those not familiar with uh, HSSG, this was the precursor to uh, the 40 gig standard. And this was a slide that we use as justification for why we want uh, 40 gig. Uh, and back then we said, you know, we're going to have to build this. Uh, th this mess uh, if you don't get uh, if 40 gig doesn't arrive there in time and back then we said you know we'd have to do eight-way ECMPs with lags and that's way too many paths and way too many cables oh how I miss those days because uh, unfortunately we actually had to build this because 40 gig didn't come along and this really wasn't so bad compared to what we're working with now so today's topologies are a lot more complex. The previous topology uh, is a modified fat tree design. It's actually fairly easy to lay out, and it's not that bad to troubleshoot. Current topologies, uh, like any high radix topology, whether it's folded claws, a multidimensional folded claws, flight on butterfly, dragonfly, or jellyfish, whatever you want to say, uh, and whatever you want to use, for a 20,000 server cluster, you're looking at about 16,000 internal links just inside of this cluster. That excludes server to switch links. Those are just switch to switch links. Well, first of all, if you don't have that automated uh, configuration and deployment tools, good luck to you managing this thing. Uh, and good luck to you in deploying this thing. And uh, well, since most class topologies aren't built in one shot and then you walk away because it's all done, since you incrementally grow it, uh, good luck figuring out what went wrong when somebody miswired something. Um, the other interesting thing is in a topology like this, there's actually between host A and host B inside of this topology, you can take 1,024 distinct links between them. Not distinct paths, distinct links. So if you send 10 million packets of you know, random source destination addresses, you will actually use 1,000 links in order to traverse that. Well, the next time you have a condition where somebody says, hey, I have 1% uh, packet loss between host A and host B, just some quick math. How long is it going to take to troubleshoot this and figure out where things go wrong? Well, assuming no Murphy's Law, uh, you know, assuming you actually statistically, after you test half the links, you found the problem, you have to troubleshoot 512 links. Being really, really conservative and generous, you say 30 seconds per link, which is actually incredibly aggressive, that means it's going to take you uh, 256 man minutes to find which link has packet loss. This is very, very optimistic. Assuming you had 10 people who, were, who this got escalated to, and they all started working on it at the exact same time, and they perfectly divided the work so nobody's recreating the work, 
you look at 25 minutes to debug this problem. This is insane. Uh, if, if I gave the topology to my management and said, hey, if we have any minor packet loss, uh, I need 10 guys debugging it at once. They need to uh, debug it perfectly. And uh, it's still going to take 25 minutes. He's going to ask me if I'm crazy. And he's going to possibly ask me to uh, work elsewhere. Um, <laughs> so how does SDN fit into this? Well, that Unix thing uh, that has access to APIs and just, in general, an agent that can sit in a box is actually the perfect thing to deal with it. You can have a local testing agent that is completely distributed, that sits on every switch. And if you do something really, really elementary, it just looks at interface counters and says, hey, compare the number of packets sent versus the number of errors. Uh, and uh, just go, hey, Ethernet's supposed to give me 10 to the minus 12 error rate. Am I above that or below that? If uh, there's more errors than I'm expecting, perhaps this link is unhealthy. Um, you could also go you know, a step beyond that and actually run a, uh, like a ping tester local to the box that will ping test every local link. Uh, you could do something even uh, cooler and inject a magic packet into every link and just have it continuously spin through. Uh, the interface is kind of like how most fabric health monitoring is done on the big chassis. Uh, you could do RIB, FIB, health checking, like a uh, consistency checker uh, used to do in the old days. You could do a lot of local testing and detect this problem before it actually causes a problem. Once you detect it, because you have uh, you know, this very well distributed, a local agent can then take some action. It can initiate a local repair, like a FIB consistency check that goes, hey, what I have in the RIB doesn't match what I have in the FIB. Fix it. Uh, you could also do that. Um, you can develop some set of uh, algorithm that say something like, if all the links on the switch are healthy, and this is the only guy having a problem, um, well, why don't I just turn it off and take the traffic off of it? You could get a lot more intelligent than that and say, uh, well, uh, before I take that action, uh, look at the network connectivity graph, make sure that before I do that, I won't cut anything off. So uh, do a what if type of scenario, uh, am I going to get partitioning or not? Beyond that, if you're not sure that it's a safe action, Ask the controller. You can still have a controller in this network that uh, talks to this local agents that actually has a view of the entire uh, network topology. And it can make really intelligent decisions because with 16,000 internal links, you bet you're probably about 100 of them are down at any given point in time. And that's OK, because again, you have 1,000 links that go from any point to any other point. But unfortunately, the wrong 15 links being down, you might have a very large hotspot formed. Um, and that's actually the routing, pro or routing protocols are really good at uh, telling you that you have connectivity. They're really bad at telling you how much bandwidth you have between uh, any two points. And since you have this global controller that has full visibility of the entire network, it can also initiate fix-up actions. It can go, well, I'm seeing kind of a problem on, you know, in quadrant 1A of my network. Why don't I route traffic around that? And if you think about it what, uh, in terms of the entire uh, OpenFlow and uh, SDN ecosystem, that's kind of sort of what uh, a OpenFlow controller does, except this way we, um, we don't do everything via OpenFlow. This is more of a fix-up action. Whether it happens via OpenFlow protocol or BGP fix-up messages, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I know, I mean, that's heresy. Uh, but the reality is it doesn't matter what bits in the wire are as long as it does the same job. Um, and this is actually huge. Um, with this, we can have SDN-like networks on uh, hardware that doesn't support OpenFlow whatsoever. Uh, and uh, you could have, well, self-healing networks that actually fix problems before problems occur. And uh, you're not spending 256 minutes trying to debug problems that humans really shouldn't have to debug. I mean, do you really want 10 people doing ping testing? Uh, you know, uh, on all your devices. So given that this kind of will entirely doable now uh, with SDN, um, where's my pony? Because <laughs> we solved this major you know, <laughs> self-healing networks thing, so I like the pony now. Uh, and uh, with that, this is uh, kind of what we see uh, SDN, uh, the direction of SDN in large-scale data centers is that um, 
automation and local troubleshooting agents uh, it will actually give you most of uh, what we need. And that is a huge revolution in terms of capabilities. Uh, not having to burn man cycles trying to do ping testing of links that are up or down. Or I mean, at one point, we wasted 14 hours looking for a problem that had, uh, we saw packet loss one in a million packets being lost. It took 14 hours to figure out what exact link was doing that because that particular link was losing one in a million packets. It takes a long time to ping uh, to send uh, you know, 10 million packets through a link to notice a problem. And uh, SDN is one way towards uh, changing the way we do networking today. So with that, thank you. And are there any questions? We've got time for a question or two. Microphones in the aisles. I think it's a very interesting presentation about testing. So uh, I think also we had another presentation this morning about exactly the same thing, that you can test more efficiently using OpenFlow. So it's probably hard for you to quantify, but still, can you quantify the size of this market? Let's say that somebody turns this testing automation into a product. How, would be, how large would the market be, you think? Like, it's probably hard for you to quantify, but still. Um, I would say anybody that has more than like a dozen devices would probably want something like this. Uh, if you look at most enterprise IT shops, like actually, the fact that the big guys want it is no question, right? And you know, the financial houses, any, to anybody uh, whose network is money, and network being down is they're losing money, this is really important. And uh, you price it right, even the small guys that have you know, one CCNA on their staff, they require less staff. And uh, it's not that you're removing people from the equation, but you're making things easier. And you're, that's actually really important because the networking industry is so far behind where the server tool chain is, we need to catch up. So I think the market is actually very, very large. One more? Excellent talk, Igor. My name is Rakesh Patel. So I had a question um, regarding the, the cost for downtime. You mentioned that there can be a substantial amount of time that you're down, but have you monetized or figured out what the revenue loss or the SLA penalties can be for having downtime in the network? Uh, we have. I obviously can't tell you what our numbers are. Uh, but uh, it definitely differs per industry. Um, in a hospital network, the cost of downtime could be somebody being dead. Mm -hmm. uh, very large cost of downtime. Um, uh, in uh, my parents' medical office, uh, the cost of downtime is, oh, well, we'll update the chart a little later. Uh, so it depends on you know, where you are on that scale. You could be losing, I mean, if you're high frequency trading and you network, yes. uh, you're missing certain trades, you could have just cost yourself a couple of million dollars. Uh, and again, if you're my parents, you lost 15 bucks. So, okay. oh, well. All right. Thank you. Right, last question here. Hi, uh, my name is Vip, Vipin Gar, and I have a question about the VM movement. On an average, in a large data center like you have, how many VM movement you see, uh, and what are the, some of the best practices you are do, uh, you are adopting to for the VM movements? Um, I'm not going to talk about what we see, but in general. What you will probably be seeing is uh, most VM movements will come in bursts. Uh, for example, you decide to spin up, you know, you got a new customer or something and new application, you have to spin up a thousand VMs. Uh, you're gonna spin them up, then you're gonna go, oh wait, now I've spun up a VM that is really CPU heavy and uh, it's sitting in the same box as another VM that's CPU heavy. Perhaps I should move them away. Uh, also, the other types of bursts come from uh, when you're performing maintenance. Uh, you want to move VMs out of the way of the maintenance. So it's not that there's a uh, VM movement average. It's just that uh, when they come, when the bursts come, that's very large. And obviously, the larger the data center, uh, the, um, the more it's going to be. Thank you, Igor. Right, thank you very much.